Hi everyone, this video will introduce you to hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is a type of statistical inference. Remember that statistical inference is using data from a sample to reach a conclusion about a population that isn't a proven conclusion. In the last few videos, we've been talking about a certain type of statistical inference, which is called estimation. Estimation is a type of statistical inference in which a value is calculated with data from a sample to estimate what the value would have been equaled if data had been collected from all population members. In other words, estimation is using a sample value to estimate a population value. But estimation is just one type of statistical inference. The other type of statistical inference is hypothesis testing. In a hypothesis test, you use data from a sample to decide between two competing possibilities about the population. In other words, you use data from a sample to decide which of two competing possibilities is true about the population that the sample came from. In this video, in this video we'll talk about what those two competing possibilities are. And in this video, um, we won't actually go um, over any technical examples with uh, real data sets. We'll actually just um, go through some analogies um, involving everyday situations because I think that'll make some of the concepts more clear. And then in later videos, we'll get into some real hypothesis tests in which data in which you actually do hypothesis tests with real data sets. So let's go over some everyday analogies to help us understand some hypothesis testing vocabulary. A hypothesis test is a procedure to use to decide between two competing possibilities called a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. We'll talk about what these two terms mean. And in a hypothesis test, the null hypothesis is basically the possibility that nothing is happening, nothing is going on. The alternative hypothesis is the possibility that something is happening, meaning something is going on. So the null hypothesis is the absence, it's the possibility of the absence of something, and the alternative hypothesis is the possibility of presence or existence of something. Here's some real life examples of a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. If I'm wondering whether I get a cold, the null hypothesis would say that I'm not getting a cold, because this is a possibility that nothing is happening. The alternative hypothesis would say that I am getting a cold, because the alternative hypothesis is a possibility that something is happening. So the reason why it's called the alternative hypothesis is just because it's the alternative to the null. It's the opposite of the null hypothesis. That's where the word alternative comes from. Here's another example. If I'm wondering whether there's a mouse living inside the walls of my house, then the null hypothesis would be the possibility that there's no mouse living inside the walls of my house. And the alternative would be the possibility that there is a mouse. So once again, it's the possibility of the, it's the possibility of the absence of something the possibility of the existence or presence of something. If I was wondering if my computer has a virus, the null would say that I'm not having, that I, I don't have a virus, and the alternative would say that my computer does have a virus. So here's, those are some examples of a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis in, in, in an everyday situation. The null and alternative actually have um, symbols that we'll go over. In statistics, the symbol for the null hypothesis is H0 or HO, and the symbol for the alternative hypothesis is H1. So, in my cold example, HO is I don't have a cold, and H1 is I do have a cold. Those are the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. In the mouse example, HO, the null, is the possibility that there's no mouse inside the walls of my house, and H1, the alternative, 
is a possibility that there is a mouse inside the walls of my house. And this, this would be HO and H1 for the computer example. HO, the null, says it says that there's no virus. And H1, the alternative, says that there is a virus. So the null is a possibility of no virus. The alternative is a possibility that there is a virus. In a hypothesis test, the null hypothesis gets the benefit of the doubt until there's enough evidence to say that the null is false. In other words, the null gets the benefit of the doubt until there's enough evidence to say that something is going on. For example, I wouldn't assume that I don't have a cold until I start to have symptoms of a cold. I would give the null hypothesis the benefit of the doubt until I had evidence otherwise. It's like how in a jury trial, the person is innocent until um, there's enough evidence to say that they're guilty. The null hypothesis of innocence gets the benefit of the doubt until there's strong enough evidence to, to say that the null isn't true and that the person is guilty and that something is going on. So in a hypothesis test, Data has to be gathered, and then once the data is gathered um, and calculations are done, the, uh, one of two decisions is made. The two, the two decisions that can be made in a hypothesis test are to reject the null hypothesis, meaning to decide that the null is false, and to say that something is happening. The other decision is to fail to reject the null hypothesis, which basically says that you don't reject the null hypothesis, you continue to give the null the benefit of the doubt. So if I, if I decide, well, in a hypothesis test, one of these decisions is made, one decision or the other is made. You either reject the null hypothesis or you fail to reject the null hypothesis based on the data that you've collected. If, um, if I decided that I do have a cold, then I've rejected the null hypothesis. I've decided that um, I do have a cold and something is happening. I've rejected the null hypothesis of no cold. If I just assume that I don't have a cold and that um, and that I'm and that nothing is happening. I, I fail to reject the null hypothesis, meaning I've um, decided to give the null hypothesis the benefit of the doubt. This is what's done when there's not enough evidence to say that something is happening. So if you do have enough evidence to say that something is happening, you reject the null hypothesis. If you don't have enough evidence to say that something is happening, you fail to reject the null hypothesis. And this wording sounds a little bit strange, so I'll try to explain what it means, or I'll try to clarify. The, the researcher in a study usually wants to reject the null hypothesis. Because the researcher wants to say that, that something is happening. And if the researcher doesn't, doesn't gather enough evidence to confidently conclude that something is happening, it's like a failure. The person has failed to reject the null hypothesis. They failed to show evidence that something is going on. So that's where the wording comes from. So. In the example um, in which I wonder if I'm having a cold, if I cough 10 times during the day and I'm convinced that I do have a cold, I've rejected the null hypothesis. I have rejected the possibility of no cold. However, if I only cough one time and I decide that that's not enough evidence to decide I have a cold, and I decide that it happened just by chance, I've failed to reject the null hypothesis, meaning I've 
I don't have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis, so I'll give it the benefit of the doubt and assume that I, that I don't have a cold. I'll assume that the null is true. And now we'll actually get into the calculations that have to be done with the data to make a decision about whether to reject the null hypothesis in a hypothesis test. In a hypothesis test, a value called the test statistic is calculated to measure the amount of evidence that the data is showing against the null hypothesis. In other words, the test statistic is calculated to show the amount of evidence that something is going on. If the test statistic comes out to zero, the data is showing no evidence against the null hypothesis. Um, there's no evidence to say that anything is happening. So the date, if the test statistic comes out to zero, the data is perfectly consistent with the null hypothesis of nothing happening. The higher the test statistic, or the further it is from zero, the more evidence there is against the null hypothesis. In other words, the more evidence there is against the possibility that nothing is happening. And this is the way people, um, this is the wording that people would use in statistics. They would say against the null hypothesis. But if you wanted to reword this, you could say the higher the test statistic, the more evidence the data is showing um, for the alternative hypothesis. Meaning, the more, the higher the test statistic, the more evidence the, the data is showing for the possibility that something is happening. That's a way to reword this, but in statistics, they would say against the null hypothesis. So, in my cold analogy, my test statistic would just be the number of times I cough during the day. If I cough zero times and my test statistic is zero, there's no evidence against the null. It perfectly, this outcome would perfectly line up with the possibility that, that I'm healthy and I don't have a cold. There's no reason to say that the null is wrong. But, Higher outcomes show more and more evidence against the null hypothesis. The higher outcomes show more and more evidence that the null is wrong and that I do have a cold. So let's say if I cough a, a large, really large number of times, I have really strong evidence against the null hypothesis. I have really strong evidence against the possibility that that I don't have a cold. The reason why higher outcomes, the reason why higher values of the test statistic show more evidence against the null is because they're less likely to happen when the null is true. Something like one or two coughs could, um, could easily happen when the null is true. I could cough one time by chance or two times by chance. Those are likely to happen when the null is true. But once you go up to higher outcomes, the outcomes are less and less likely to happen when the null is true. For example, I might be really unlikely to cough 10 times when I don't have a cold. That outcome would be unlikely to happen when the null is true. And the main idea of a hypothesis test is that if the test statistic comes out to a large enough number that's really unlikely to happen when the null is true, then the null should be rejected. You should say that something is happening. That's the main logic of a hypothesis test. So when you do a hypothesis test, you have to set a minimum value or a cutoff point that the test statistic has to reach before you're willing to reject the null hypothesis and say that something is happening. This minimum value is called the critical value. If I say that, um, that I have to cough seven times during the day, 
in order to be convinced that I have a cold, then seven coughs is my critical value. It's the outcome that I have to reach in order to reject the null hypothesis. In, a, in order to reject the possibility that I, that I don't have a cold. If the nested statistic comes out too low and it doesn't reach the critical value, you fail to reject the null hypothesis. You just assume that the null is true. So if I only cough one or two times during the day, that's lower than my critical value. So I would just assume that it happened by chance and that nothing is going on. So the decision in a hypothesis test really just depends on which side of the critical value that the test statistic ends up on. If the test statistic comes out lower than the critical value, you fail to reject the null. If the test statistic comes out to the critical value or higher, you reject the null. So this is just um, something that I've already talked about. Well, here's an example in which I've set the critical value to four coughs. So if I cough, if the number of times that I cough during the day ends up somewhere in here, I fail to reject the null. I just give it the benefit of the doubt and say that I'm not sick. If it lands here at four or higher, I reject the null and say that the null is false and that I do have a cold. Now, it's important to remember, or it's important to realize that if the outcome reaches the critical value or higher and lands in this red area, it doesn't prove that the null is false. It simply shows enough evidence to be, um, to confidently conclude that the null is false and should be rejected. So, just like in any study um, that we've talked about so far, your, the outcome isn't a proven conclusion. It's just an inference. So like I said, the, the outcome of a hypothesis test isn't a proven conclusion. If my outcome lands in here and I say that I'm not sick. That could be a wrong conclusion. I might be sick after all. Or if it lands in here and I say that I am sick, that could be wrong. Maybe I just coughed a large number of times by chance. Maybe I ran into some dust. So it's not a proven conclusion. It's In a hypothesis test, you're just deciding what the evidence appears to, to be showing. So in here you would reject the null hypothesis, and in here you would fail to reject. There's actually a technical name for all of the values of the test statistic that are at the critical value and higher. Um, outcomes that are in that area are called the rejection region. So this red area that includes all values of the critical value and above it's called the rejection region. It's called the rejection region because it includes all of the values of the test statistic that would lead you to reject the null. If the test statistic falls in the rejection region, you reject the null hypothesis. And the critical value is part of the rejection region, because if the test statistic lands right at the critical value, you do reject the null. The idea, or the logic, is that outcomes in the rejection region are so unlikely to happen when the null is true that they suggest that the null should be rejected, and you should, and you should say that something appears to be happening. And in a hypothesis test, one of two wrong conclusions can be reached. Like I said, it's not a proven conclusion. You can make a type 1 error which is rejecting the HO, rejecting the null, when it's actually true. This is when you 
um, say that something is happening and that the null is false, but in reality, nothing is happening and your outcome just happened by chance. An example could be deciding that I have a cold when I really don't have one after all. A type 2 error is the opposite. It's failing to show enough evidence that the null is false. When in reality, the null is false and something really is going on. So it's like um, deciding that I don't have a cold because I don't have enough evidence, but in reality, I really do have one. That's a type 2 error. So um, in a scientific study, the type 1 error would be um, an embarrassing outcome because you've decided that you've shown evidence for something and you've supported something with your data, but in reality nothing is really going on and your data appeared just by chance. A type 2 error is more of a frustrating outcome because you've failed to show evidence for something. Your data didn't back it up, but in reality what you wanted to show it really is true. You just failed to, your data just failed to capture enough evidence for it. Um, there used to be a show on uh, Bigfoot hunters, and they would, I think they would go and look for footprints. Imagine uh, that someone goes out and finds footprints on a trail, and they're, and they're convinced that those are Bigfoot footprints, and they say that I, I found evidence that Bigfoot is true, and I'm concluding that Bigfoot, Bigfoot does exist. But it, later it turns out that, that that footprint really was from some other animal, and and there really is no Bigfoot after all. That's a type 1 error. I've decided that something is going on, but really nothing is going on. If I go out on the trail, and I don't see any footprints, and I assume that there's no Bigfoot, I assume that the null is true, but later it turns out that that Bigfoot really does exist, I, but I just never found any footprints. That would be a type 2 error. Something really is going on, but I just didn't find enough evidence for it. And here's a diagram. Um, reality could either be the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis. It could be that nothing is happening or something is happening. And the decision you make based on your data can go with the null or with the alternative. If you reject the null, your decision is with the alternative. If you, if you don't reject the null, if you fail to reject, your decision is sticking with the null hypothesis. If you make this decision, and that is really reality, you've made a correct non-rejection, you correctly decided to not reject the null hypothesis. If the alternative is true, something is happening, and your decision is with the alternative that something is happening, it's a correct rejection. You've correctly rejected the null hypothesis. You were correct to throw out the null hypothesis. These other two are errors. If your decision goes with the alternative and you reject the null, but the null is true, it's a type 1 error. If you give the null the benefit of the doubt, meaning you fail to reject the null, and the alternative is true, something really is going on, that's a type 2 error. Type 2 error is when something really is happening in reality, you just didn't find enough evidence for it, and you were stuck with the null hypothesis. You couldn't reject it based on your data. So this covers a lot of the basic vocabulary for hypothesis testing, and we'll um, continue to use this vocabulary later when we talk about actual hypothesis tests um, based on um, actual data sets.